for locating this precious time to join us today. This session is about 30 to 45 minutes. And if you do have any questions, you may type it out at the bottom below there and Dr. Ho will answer it at the end of his sessions. Okay, before we start our sessions, let's do a short introduction of Dato, Dr. Ho Tekok. Dato has worked and trained in the UK over 15 years. So his practice in vascular surgery range from treatment of spider veins, varicose vein, diabetic, foot ulcer, and major surgery for optic aneurysms. Besides, his practice in general surgery include treatments of galister, appendix, hernias, breast, lumps, thyroid disease, laser hemorrhoid surgery, laparoscopy surgery, and endoscopy. Okay, so uh, without any delays, uh, now with much honor, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Ho, our consultant general and vascular surgeon of Columbia Asia Hospital, Talin Jaya, to start with his talk. Okay, in this webinar, we will talk about varicose veins, uh, hemorrhoids, and finally, we talk a little bit about the core study on similarities of varicose veins and hemorrhoids. Next. Next. Um, as we all know, varicose veins are big veins under the skin of the legs. Can you show the picture? Uh, Yes, you can see these uh, pictures here. They are bulging, widened, and twisted. See this is the video to show the valves of the healthy vein on the left side, which it closes and opens, and the diseased vein on the right side, which shows that the valve is not closing properly and there is a leakage of blood in that particular vein. Next slide. So it's a very common condition. One third of men and women aged 18 to 64 years of age will have truncal varices. That means the uh, reflux of long saphenous vein and short saphenous vein. And venous insufficiency it is the commonest cause of leg ulcers. 80% of the times of leg ulcers are caused by a vein problem. Next slide. So it's not just a cosmetic condition. So you can see here there are a lot of risk factors. Uh, I'm sure we are all quite familiar with it. So just to go through the anatomy, um, we have a deep venous system and a superficial venous system. The deep venous system is in sort of a purplish blue color and the superficial venous system in the bluish color. So we have the gray saphenous vein that comes down on the middle aspect of the leg anteriorly, and the short saphenous vein, which is starts from the popliteal vein down to the foot at the back of the leg. So this is to show that not all varicose veins are of truncal origin. They can appear and they can originate from various different perforators in the leg. So let's go through the symptoms. Cosmetic, aching, discomfort, and heaviness of the legs, fixed swelling, dry, itchy skin, burning, throbbing in the legs. But more importantly, most of the times patients will come with open ulcers, bleeding after minor injury, and thrombophlebitis and deep vein thrombosis are two serious uh, presentations that they can happen. Now, during this time of uh, COVID 19, it's known that patients will have, uh, the blood will have, uh, it is more coagulable. So therefore, it's quite important to suspect a deep vein thrombosis and thrombophlebitis in patients who present with leg swelling and erythema. Next. So classification of varicose veins. Zero to six. Zero, there's no invisible veins. One, you have spider veins. Two, you have varicose veins that you can see. Three is when you have leg swelling. Four is when you have the skin changes. You have this pigmentation of venous eczema, lipodermatosclerosis. Five is when there's a healed venous ulcer. And six, when there is an active venous ulcer. Next. 
Okay, this is the ultrasound duplex, which what we will see when we do the ultrasound scan. Okay, so on the left side, you can see that this, uh, can I have the, yeah. Okay, here we can see this is the reflux pattern. There you go, you can see the reflux below here. So we do a Valsalva or augmentation test. There you go, this is the reflux. This is prolonged, okay? And this is, you can see actually the blood flow leaking out into the saphenous vein, okay? Now, according to the NICE guideline from the UK, ultrasound duplex is necessary to confirm the diagnosis of varicose veins and the extent of truncal reflux. And also number two, the purpose is to plan for the treatment for patients with suspected primary or recurrent varicose veins. So it's, it's a, a, a gold standard to have varicose veins patients to have uh, ultrasound duplex to be done. And normally it's advisable to have it performed by the surgeon who is doing the procedure. Because for the second reason here, and actually plan the treatment, not just to confirm the diagnosis. How do we move this out? The photo. Okay, um, here you can see that the ultrasound scan, that what we see. This is the saphenofemoral junction. This is the long saphenous vein. You can see down here, it's going down on the transfer section, going down the thigh. And here you can see there's a branch that comes out, okay? And then we go, go down again. So if you can see just now, without doing this uh, ultrasound scan, you will miss the branches and therefore the outcome of the procedure will not be good. Patients will have recurrence almost immediately. And in terms of the treatment for varicose veins, we are all uh, very familiar uh, with the MPFF or Deflon. Uh, in this great recommendation, which is from the European Society of Vascular Surgery, uh, it's been recommended that Deflon 500 milligrams is uh, beneficial in terms of relieving the symptoms associated with patients with chronic venous disease, uh, irrespective of the class, whether it's class zero to class six, as well as it's also good for the uh, leg swelling. So this is to show the effectiveness of Deflon uh, from the Edinburgh Bain study. So there is an improvement in symptoms related to chronic venous disease with a six month Deflon 500 milligram treatment. So you can see here, the dark blue bar is before treatment and the Gray color bar represents uh, the percentage of patients with symptoms after six months of treatment. So you can see that in heaviness, swelling and cramp symptoms, all these have reduced significantly if six months treatment of Deflon. Now, if conservative treatment is not uh, successful or the symptoms are persistent, then it will be advisable to refer to vascular service. And according to the NICE guideline again, uh, it will be indicated to refer if there is a symptomatic primary or symptomatic uh, recurrent varicose veins, or if there is lower limb skin changes such as pigmentation, eczema, caused by venous insufficiency, <coughs> superficial vein thrombosis. Now, they can usually be confused and as a cellulitis. So patients can come with this sort of presentation, redness on the skin, which is uh, tender to touch. And usually what we, uh, to differentiate from cellulitis is that you, the vein is sometimes palpable as a thickened cord. And you can see that it's very tender and it's in the uh, distribution of the uh, uh, saphenous veins. Um, 
Of course, when somebody has a venous ulcer that do not heal after two weeks of treatment, that is an indication to refer. Or even though they have a healed venous ulcer, it's also quite important to be referred to prevent the recurrence of the venous ulcer. Uh, so upon referral, just to share that what uh, is been done to the patients, uh, again, according to this guideline, nice guideline, uh, the first option of treatment is to offer endothermal ablation, uh, either using radio frequency or laser. Number two, the second option is ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy if the first option is not available. If the first two options are not suitable or available, then only surgery is offered. Uh, I must say that the vascular surgeons have hardly been doing open surgery in the past five to 10 years. If there is uh, incompetent tributaries to be treated, then they need to be treated at the same time. Uh, this would be uh, a reasonable uh, approach to prevent uh, recurrence. Um, in terms of compression stockings, uh, nowadays with these minimally invasive treatments being available, uh, the stockings are not uh, recommended as an alternative treatment option. Previously it was because uh, compared to open surgery, it's, it's quite a, uh, not so minimally invasive, but now with the minimally invasive treatments, uh, it's advisable to undergo for a curative approach. Um, in terms of the advantages of uh, endovenous ablation, uh, it's small incision, it's only a pinhole, there's no incisions uh, as such can be seen, far less bruising, uh, very minimal pain, can be performed on a local anesthetic, which is good for most of the patients as most of them will be quite elderly with a lot of comorbidities. It's a daycare procedure, saves a lot of costs, and the veins do not really grow back, it is performed properly. And it also can be used to treat non saponous origin of varicose veins. Um, to show the how the procedure is done, just to share a quick video. This is the uh, laser fiber, which is very thin. Uh, it's as thick as the tip of the pen, uh, ballpoint pen. You can see there's the light at the end that emits the laser. Um, it's done as a sterile procedure, which uh, the surgeon will be gown up. And the ultrasound is a very important tool in terms of Forming this procedure. The video is a gem. Okay, here we go. Under the ultrasound guidance, uh, the vein is located and is punctured. So without the ultrasound scan, we cannot see the vein, and therefore it's so important to have the ultrasound scan. So now that the vein is in excess, that's the laser fiber. It is very flexible and it has a blunt tip, so it's hardly likely that it can damage the vein. So it's inserted into the vein, and you can see that the light of the laser under the skin in a little short while. And this is the laser fiber in the vein. See live on the ultrasound scan. It goes up all the way to the cephalofemoral junction. And then we give the tumescent anesthesia. Tumescent anesthesia is given to compress the vein so that there's a good contact with the vein wall and the laser fiber. And also to push away the important structures such as nerve, as well as to absorb the heat emitted by the laser. So it goes up to the cephalofemoral junction border and the tributaries can be sealed as well. And here you go, the laser is withdrawn at the rate of 1 cm per 10 seconds.
This is to show that it can also be performed for the shorts and fitness lane in the back of the leg using the exactly the same technique. And you can see that the vein has been sealed almost immediately. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, the next slide is a video on radio frequency ablation, which is almost identical in terms of the technique. It's just that we use a different kind of fiber. Instead of laser, we use the radio frequency fiber. Um, Home therapy this is how we do it. It's a very simple process in which we use fibrovein as the active, uh, active uh, ingredient. And we use a tessari method in which we mix the fibrovein with air at a ratio of one to four, like this. So we mix the air and the fibrovein. So then it becomes a foam, white color uh, substance. So that's why it's called foam sclerotherapy. Just a short video to show how it's done. There is no uh, volume. No, that's okay. So you can see that they're trying to locate the vein. The vein is up here. And you can see the needle is coming in. That's the needle, the white color needle. Yeah, now the needle is in the vein now. That's the whole length of the vein. So the needle is inside. And then when the sclerosin is injected, you can see the whole vein turns white. Immediately it spasms and shuts the vein down. Okay, other newer methods are such as uh, this uh, mechanical occlusion with chem resistance or called MOCA or using a glue to seal up the vein. And these are newer techniques, uh, which we don't really have a long-term results yet. So just to go through a few uh, cases in terms of how the patients can pre present. So this is a young lady, salesperson, who presents with a uh, leg swelling. You can see that the left leg is more swollen than the right leg. And you can see, in uh, closer inspection, there's some telltale signs that she has uh, varicose veins. It's not easy to spot the varicose veins because the leg is quite big. The next one is a teacher. It's quite clear, you can see the varicose veins here. That's after the treatment. Uh, this is a young man, has a huge varicose at the back of the knee. He's Presents with a, presented with a bleeding because of a trauma to the veins at the back here. And that's after treatment with uh, the laser therapy. That's also him in another view. So again, young men, uh, ulcers with a severe skin changes uh, in the leg, and he works as a waiter. So all these patients so far, they have risk factors of uh, standing for long hours of, uh, during their work. And this is after the procedure has been done, the ulcer has healed. Otherwise, he, he had his ulcer for six months. Another lady, she had a previous uh, treatment done with stripping, but it's uh, come back in terms of, you can see the ulcer here. So this lady was treated with uh, sclerotherapy because the veins are, the recurrent veins are a lot tortuous and smaller. And also can heal. So as long as we treat the cause of the ulcer, then the ulcer usually will heal quite well. You can see this lady presented quite late, which is quite severe, and after treatment. So this is a, a, a lady who's had uh, varicose veins, but had sort of a, a mild trauma to the uh, area in the distribution of varicose veins. And then she presented with this sort of uh, uh, leg, a swollen leg, 
every three months. So she has actually a very severe thrombophlebitis, and you can see that this is a thrombus on the ultrasound scan sitting just next to the uh, saphenofemoral junction. So if this thrombus were to extend, go into the deep brain, and the patient will develop deep brain thrombosis with the risk of getting pulmonary embolism. This is, again, uh, another gentleman who's had a previous uh, arterial disease of the ankle joint. He doesn't really have varicose veins, but he had an arterial disease of the ankle joint. And because of this reason, he cannot dorsiflex or, or plantarflex the ankle joint, and he has lost the uh, function of the gastronomous makes arterial venous ulcers, especially in patients with diabetes. For example, this patient, he has what looks like a venous ulcer, but Actually, he also has peripheral arterial disease, and it's important to have the peripheral arterial disease treated first before treating the venous ulcer, because by treating the venous ulcer, it needs compression. With compression, it will make the ulcer worse uh, if there is arterial insufficiency. So you can see that this is the angiogram of that patient. There is a lack of blood supply coming in, and after the uh, angioplasty, he has a good blood supply coming down to the leg. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, varicose vein is a very common condition. It has and can cause serious morbidities and affect the quality of life. The gold standard treatment for varicose vein is thermal endovenous ablation at the moment. So the second part of the uh, talk is about hemorrhoids, which we all know very well about hemorrhoids. I'm just going to run through them without going too much into detail. Uh, hemorrhoids refers to a pathologic presentation of uh, hemorrhoidal venous cushions. And that's for our purpose of discussion today. Uh, that's what we refer hemorrhoids as. Uh, actually, the hemorrhoidal venous cushions, they are normal structures in the anal rectum and are anatomically present unless a previous intervention has taken place. So uh, this is again, uh, a very uh, picture which is uh, very familiar for all of us. The important uh, landmarks here will be the pectinate line. Now, with the pectinate line here, the hemorrhoids that presents above it, above the pectinate line, uh, that's we call the internal hemorrhoids. The hemorrhoids that is below the pectinate line will be the external hemorrhoids and this one here is an internal hemorrhoid which has prolapsed to become external um, the other anatomy landmarks to be aware of is the internal sphincter and the external sphincter so patients are usually from my experience they're quite concerned about injury to the external anal sphincter from operations, which can lead to fecal incontinence. Uh, risk factors for hemorrhoids, again, very similar to varicose veins, uh, constipation, pregnancy, prolonged sitting in toilets, a uh, whole list of other risk factors that has been associated with hemorrhoidal disease. Um, Again, we are all familiar with symptoms, rectal bleeding, prolapse, uh, pruritus ani, thrombose hemorrhoids. Uh, four thrombose hemorrhoids uh, can present like this. The patient will have a lump and it's very tense and very painful. Uh, they normally come to uh, seek treatment as an emergency. Uh, in terms of the grading of hemorrhoids, we have one, two, three, and four. One is the least severe and four is the most severe. Um, uh, four means that the prolapse hemorrhoids is not able to be reduced. Uh, so a lot of the times patients will come quite late. Uh, in terms of investigations, clinical examination, we do a proctoscopy uh, after the digital examination, uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, if patients will have a bright red, uh, rectal bleed, or colonoscopy. A colonoscopy would be advisable if the rectal bleeding is not typical of hemorrhoids. Uh, 
uh, or there is a strong risk factors for colonic malignancy. Okay, and apart from that, we do a blood test, FBC, to check patients not anemic, and also coagulation studies, make sure that they are not uh, prone to bleeding. Uh, in terms of treatments, for grade one, internal and non thrombosis external hemorrhoids, we can try conservative treatments. Uh, that will consist of high fiber diets, 25 grams of fibers a day, adequate fluid intake, as well as full softeners, because the fibers, uh, on its own will not be effective. They will need fluids. Uh, topical and systemic analgesics, uh, if there is pain or inflammation, uh, we need a proper anal age hygiene, and in some cases, a short course of tropical, uh, topical steroid cream. Uh, flavor tonics such as Deflon have been shown to be effective, especially when patients come in quite acutely, we can go for a high dose of Deflon. And finally, retraining of the patient's toilet habit, because if those who've got constipation, then they will get uh, recurrence of this hemorrhoidal disease attacks. Um, if the conservative treatments are not uh, successful or the symptoms are persistent, then uh, they might choose to go for uh, more sort of uh, definitive treatments. That includes minor procedures such as injection of sclerosing agents or rubber band ligation, infrared photocoagulation, and these are uh, day care procedures. Uh, further than this, uh, open hemorrhoidectomy, uh, standard uh, treatment in the past, uh, or stapling device which can staple the hemorrhoids, it actually pushes the hemorrhoids up, staples it in the anorectal region or a newer sort of a treatment method such as a laser hemorrhoids procedure. Uh, again, it's actually the same kind of laser fiber that we use, uh, except that the tip here is quite sharp so that it can go into the hemorrhoids. And this is the laser machine, which is quite small, as you can see. So this is an uh, animation to, sh to show how this uh, procedure is form which is very simple. You can see there's the hemorrhoid here. And you put in a proctoscope, sort of a half and if this hemorrhoid that is visible, the laser is inserted into the hemorrhoid. And then the laser is activated once it's activated, it shrinks the hemorrhoids, just like the varicose veins. It shrinks it and it occludes it, and it will, with time, it will slowly dissolve away. So, just an example, this patient has quite a large hemorrhoid, which after the laser treatment, it's actually shrunk quite well. Uh, and you can notice that there is no uh, cuts, which means that there will be minimal pain for the patient in terms of recovery. Uh, here we go, almost pain-free uh, in terms of the laser procedure. It can be done as a daycare or a minimal one-night stay. Uh, there is no risk of incontinence because we don't cut. Therefore, there is uh, minimal risk in terms of uh, injuring the uh, external anal sphincter. No open wound, leading to less risk of infection. You don't leave any uh, foreign body inside, such as staples. And it can be repeated or combined with other procedures. So in conclusions, uh, hemorrhoidal disease is a common condition. Initial conservative treatment is uh, reasonable. If the symptoms persist, then consider the uh, more definitive treatment with various procedures that's available. Um, now, the last part of the talk, we talk about the CHORUS study. Uh, the CHORUS stands for Chronic Venous and Hemorrhoidal Diseases Evaluation and Scientific Research. So it's a very interesting study because it's a very big study. It's worldwide multi-center survey of including seven countries involving more than 9,000 patients. Uh, 
uh, essentially, uh, the gist of it is that the patients who complain of hemorrhoids problems are referred or referred by another doctor for hemorrhoids were screened during two conservative months of consultation. They basically screen for any uh, chronic venous disease during this period. And with the results, among all the hemorrhoid patients, half of them presented with chronic venous disorders at the same time. And also, the higher the grade of the hemorrhoids, the higher the concomitants of chronic venous disease. So in conclusion, this study provides a snapshot of current profiles, risk factors, and treatments of patients with hemorrhoidal disease across the globe. Now, the coexistence of hemorrhoidal disease and chronic venous disease in more than half the study population it highlights the importance of examining for chronic venous disease among patients with hemorrhoid diagnosis, particularly if they have shared risk factors for these two conditions. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have some questions uh, I can see here from Dr. Joseph Lam. The first one, your question is, what's the recurrence rate with endogenous, endogenous laser and sclerosin therapy. So the recurrence rate, if it's done properly, uh, is very good. Out of 100 veins that has been treated, the recurrence rate in five years is, I would say, less than 3%. So the reason is that some of these uh, rates will uh, differ among the operators. It depends on the treatments, whether there's any uh, accessory veins that's there that's not been missed, all the uh, tributaries that's been treated at the same time. Uh, these are the factors uh, that uh, need to be considered. Okay, the next question by Dr. Raymond Go: How much do these procedures cost? Um, these procedures uh, can be done in local anesthetic. The cost is usually between 8,000 to 10,000 ringgit under local anesthetic. What is the cost of laser hemorrhoid treatments? Uh, the cost of laser hemorrhoid treatments is slightly more expensive uh, because most of the times it needs to be done under uh, general anesthesia. And that will involve uh, additional hospital costs and the anesthetic costs. So it will be around uh, 12,000 ringgit on average. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lo. He says that's good points. Uh, Dr. Manjit Singh, any age limit for laser treatment for hemorrhoids? Um, it depends on the uh, patient's uh, fitness for general anesthesia. Uh, that's basically the uh, limiting factor. Um, if uh, the patient can tolerate under sedation and under local, then these are, uh, can be performed, but not commonly. We have a few more questions coming in. Okay, from Dr. Edwin Ho. Uh, how do you decide, the question is, how do you decide which is the best treatment modality for various hemorrhoids and varicose veins? So second question is, is there one or two important factors to look at to design? Okay, let's talk about varicose veins first. Uh, for varicose veins, uh, as uh, we've been through, the first option of treatment that is highly recommended is endothermal ablation. And now, I would say that will treat almost all cases of varicose veins. If the patients 
who has had treatment before, such as stripping, and they don't have the truncal veins that is present. The treatment options, then uh, you can consider uh, injection of uh, foam scrap therapy. Uh, again, it depends on the uh, ultrasound uh, findings. If the vein is, has got a reasonable uh, length of uh, straight segment, which the laser fiber can access, then there's no, no limit to the use of the laser in terms of a treatment of the varicose veins. Um, it can also be used to treat a lot of the perforators, uh, which cannot be treated with open surgery. So I would say uh, it's not difficult to design. Uh, my first uh, and my, my, my uh, first option of treatment is always endothermal ablations, plus minus uh, concomitant foam therapy. So as for the hemorrhoids, um, as we can see, there was quite a few options. It depends on the grading uh, of the hemorrhoids. If it's quite small, uh, grade one or grade two, um, patients uh, have an option of uh, those uh, minor procedures as we talked about, such as rubber band ligation or injection of sclerosins uh, or even laser treatments. And they're quite large then uh, to consider a laser. Uh, my preferential mode of treatment would be uh, using a laser uh, treatment for hemorrhoids. Uh, it depends on the operator basically. Uh, there is no uh, sort of uh, hard and fast rules about which treatment uh, needs to be used for what sort of hemorrhoids. It's mostly operator dependent. Next one is uh, from Dr. Yong Chi Chan. It says that uh, patients are likely to have both diseases. Do you regularly do laser treatment on both sites if both are present and symptomatic? Um, I don't. Uh, it, the, the whether you do it uh, simultaneously or not, it depends on uh, detailed discussion with the patients. Um, hemorrhoids, even though they're present, may not necessarily need treatment. I always tell my patients that uh, it depends on the symptoms that the hemorrhoids causes. Uh, if it doesn't cause any symptoms and they are happy to live with it, then uh, by all means, uh, continue the conservative treatment. Dr. Yu Fu Chun, can we refer for interventional procedures early rather than to wait till a later stage? Um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, referral early at an early stage is always advisable because treatment at the later stages uh, will be uh, more difficult to treat usually. Uh, Dr. Edholz says thank you. Um, Dr. Ismail Majid, can I use uh, that prednisolone as anti-inflammatory treatment for PAL as adjuvant to Deflon and Anusol? Does antibiotic help in treatment of how okay um uh, tablet prednisolone uh, is of course an anti-inflammatory uh, tablet uh, however um, it's not commonly used in terms of uh, treating the uh, hemorrhoids uh, as usually uh, topical uh, steroids such as anusol or xyloprop these sort of uh, suppositories uh, will work better does antibiotic help in treatment of PALS? Um, the answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, if it's infected, then yes, it probably will help. Uh, uh, the other question, uh, are we almost done? So, okay, uh, I, there's no more questions that's uh, coming through. So I'll pass you back to Adrian. Thank you very much for your attention. Full talk by Dato here. So, uh, oh yeah, just for your information. So whoever that attended this event, we will give them, uh, award them with one CBD points. Uh, we will update the MME website. So they will award the points to you accordingly. So you can let us know if you didn't receive any points. 
So um, I think that's all for today. So if I let's say I got any upcoming events or simple webinar symposium, something similar like this, we will let you know again. Hopefully by somewhere around middle of May, we will have another session with you all. So stay tuned and stay healthy and stay safe in your clinic. Thank you.